Good evening, all together here in Edith Marion's house near the Goethe Anum and to those who listen um, to this evening talk about Maria Krebiel Darmstädte, a victim, a Jewish victim of Auschwitz Birkenau, of the main disaster of the 20th century. We decided to include her in this serial of lectures about Jewish or Hebrew humanism, as Martin Buber used the term, knowing that she was, as Simone Weil, a person who probably never deep um, imbued, deep immersed into Jewish religion. Actually, we don't know what kind of literature, with what kind of Jewish philosophy she was studying, but her main, main, main interest was Christianity. But she, she took over the tragedy um, of the Jewish people and she shared um, the way to Auschwitz-Birkenau. It is her birthday today. This was one element of the decision to choose this evening, to think in her direction. She was born on the 22nd of June, 1892, in the German city of Mannheim. And we are close to St. John's Day um, on Saturday, and Rudolf Steiner described this period, this cycle of the year, this time of the year as a moment of historical conscience. So we thought it is important to think in her direction. Also in the Goethe Arnum, she was one of those who visited, who came to the opening of the second Goethe Arnum on Michael Mess 1928. And she was especially fascinated, deeply touched by the statue of the representative of humanity in between the forces of evil. Later on, she had a postcard, a photography of this statue in the camp and also a photograph of Rudolf Steiner in the concentration camp of Gür. She was a deep anthroposophist, a deep member also of the Christian community. And going the path to the Christmas conference, now in many countries, the Anthroposophical Society, many people are aware of the year in which we are and facing the coming memorial of the Christmas conference after 100 years. I think it's very important to include her in these considerations. Also this reflection about human destiny. The general anthroposophical section is now preparing the St. John's conference at the Goethe Anum and this is our topic. The human destiny or let's say the anthroposophical understanding of human destiny and the karma lectures of Dr. Steiner. It is not so easy to take into account in such a conference such an extreme destiny, if you want to call it destiny, as the one of Maria Darmstädter. In the Karma Lectures, Dr. Steiner is not talking only about sensible destinies, he's also talking about destroying or in a way changing destiny by evil forces describing catastrophes of civilization where human beings are not prepared in the world of unbornness, not facing them. They are not waiting for them. They are not part of their individual and even not part of their social destiny. Steiner describes this and shows the difference to natural catastrophes where at least in the past of human evolution, sometimes bigger groups, and it's still going on today, were affected, as in Turkey and in other places. And even if 
this is another form of tragedy, he's saying it's a different path. And when he's talking about catastrophes of civilization, he's saying in, in one of the famous lectures of the Karma lectures that there is a, in a way this is a different law. It is no law, in fact, it is more or less changing laws. When we will hear now about Maria Darmstädter, it is really a single case reflection. And I want to stress this and underline this because what she made out of the concentration camps, how she, how she developed an inner philosophy of spiritual surviving, this is her path. And it's not typical, it is not for all of us, it is first of all unique. Maybe it's not only unique, maybe it's much, it is needed for the future to have such thoughts of serving selflessness because she was a person who helped the other ones in the midst of the misery. So maybe I could just start with some memories from other inmates. A fellow inmate in the camps of Gurs, which was in southern France near the Pyrenees, said she, Maria, was an extraordinary person and she helped many people in their distress. She herself passed seemingly unscathed through all privation and degradation, always thinking only of others. She emanated a powerful spirituality. She was giving advice to the other ones, helping a lot of old aged people, helping a lot of despaired people, suicidal inmates. She was sent to them. She had a certain position there, I will tell you a little bit later. And still in the last um, camp where she passed and stayed for almost some weeks before the transport came to Auschwitz, this was the Camp Trancy near Paris. The Polish Jews who were her inmates there, they called her Madame Mère Maria. In a way, this was the estimation of the other prisoners. Gertrud Spörri, the former priest of the Christian community and working for the Swiss Red Cross, who was also in contact with Maria Darmstädter in the concentration camp of Gürs, she said, for me, she, Maria Darmstädter, was always exemplary, not only in her capacity to endure suffering, but for the inner greatness and dignity that a person is capable of summoning in the midst of tragedy. Another inmate of the same camp is writing not about Maria, but a general statement about the situation of the prisoners. It was Hannah Schramm, also from a German Jew, uh, survived. And she said later on about the camp, uh, she survived. It did not matter where you came from or what your past was. Here in this camp, all that counted was who you were. Here each person had to live by their own strength, prove themselves good or bad without support or backdrop. Gürs was a testing ground where only the authentic proved its worth. And from all those who, who memorized later Maria Krebel Darmstädter in Gürs, she was one of those in a, in a type of literature who were named the saints of the concentration camps. So those who did not take care for their own survival, but only were busy with the other ones. And in a way, they did just the opposite of what the Nazis expected. Because the hidden philosophy of the Nazi camps were to transform human beings into 
we can't say animals, but into examples of the truth of social Darwinism. That means to change human beings, that everybody is only looking for his own survival, egotism as the only principle of surviving, fighting against each other. And so Primo Levi described this hierarchy established by the Nazis that they had selected prisoners and those prisoners took care for the other ones. So in a way to train people for their own survival on the cost of the other ones. So a philosophy, a philosophy of egotism or social Darwinism and we can say it was effective to a certain extent, extent but not 100%. And the extreme opposite was living in, in, in human beings as Maria Darmstädter, who, who just did the opposite. So there was a kind of resistance movement, not in a political sense, not collecting guns or trying to kill the SS officers, but just living the opposite of what is the theory and not only the theory, also the practice of those who organized the camps. And these were not only bad SS officers, I would say in the worldview of Maria Darmstädter, those forces who organized these camps, this was a kind of intelligence. She would have called them Arimanic intelligence. And how to overcome this kind of intelligence? In a way, she would maybe have said by human behavior. If you keep your inner other values, <clears throat> those forces in a way have to withdraw, at least from the one and from the one protected by those who live the opposite. So she's a very radical example and you will tonight come into a very special biography of somebody of extreme seriousness of extreme capacities of serving the other and maybe you will have the impression this is a little bit as in the old religious orders where the nuns or the monks, quite often the nuns in the past, were just serving the Christ in an ascetic manner, a kind of selflessness in at this time weakening maybe your own eye consciousness. The extremely interesting case in Maria Darmstädter's um, biography is this, that this kind of devel developing a culture of selflessness was not in, in a way diminishing, reducing her eye capacity. She was a very self-conscious person. She was a student of what we call spiritual science. So I would say a new, a new form of living of culture of selflessness, but extremely religious, which has in my spelling no negative um, side, of, side meaning. But she was, it was really this religious attitude towards the other human being, towards the spiritual world, was maybe the main driving force in her biography in the 20th century. You will hear a little bit about it. So we will encounter a person with an incredible moral and spiritual integrity, with an enormous strong inner life, I would say in a, in a new form of being a servant willingly, a person with an enormous consciousness and conscience and a deep, deep estimation of responsibility for the other one. And maybe shocking for some of you that she accepted the camps. Not accepting and saying there is a sense in these camps, there is a sense in this destroying human beings, but being there because she was part of the transport, she made the best out of it.
that the best out of it, not for her own survival, but in a way she was fighting, I would say she was a fighter, a Michaelic one, for other values. So in the middle, in the middle of a disaster of senselessness, she created values or she kept values. And therefore she said, it's a good place for me. She never said the camps are positive places. This was evil and demon and she was quite clear about it. But having the situation to be there, she, tr she tried to transform as far as it was possible for her. We are made, she once wrote in a letter out of the camp, of the very essence of devotion. The most profound thing we learn here in the camp is a fearlessness that we would never have otherwise have learned. So for her, she defined for herself only, and I think this is the only possibility to define it for your own situation, that that this is a schooling place, a schooling pl place for herself. And this is a huge difference. We have from this camp many letters from the inmates. I will tell a little bit more about the historical things. But her letters, and a lot of letters are published um, since 1945 um, by the relatives, by historians. The letters from Gürs is this is a prominent theme, or is one of the themes of um, the historians. But most of these letters, of course, are complaining letters, describing and complaining letters to... They could send letters out of the camp to Switzerland. You couldn't send complaining letters from Buchenwald home, from Auschwitz home, but from Gürs it was possible, at least to Switzerland, not directly to Germany, but some letters came then by Switzerland to Germany, so by the Red Cross or relatives. And of course, a lot of the inmates described these incredible hard life conditions, but she almost never did. I mean, with some sentences, and she knew that the other, the other ones knew as well. But she described in her letters what could be done in the midst of the misery. In a way she accepted to be there and she also said I don't want to spoil my forces with complaining or with um, hoping that I get released. A lot of the inmates of course had hope that they will be released again and go to the United States of America. There were some options. It was not completely impossible but she said, I don't want to wait for these options because then maybe I'm desperate if it's not coming. I want to collect all my forces and I want to learn and work on this place. Yes, and as an, as an Andrew Pacifist, as she was, she also wrote in a letter out of the camp on the path towards initiation, homelessness is the first probation and stage. How hard this is already. But what grace in the fact that today so many people are relieved of this choice and have been compelled to embark on the journey. The immensity of this is something we can experience at first hand in the way we grow weak and faint. We grow weak and faint. In the laceration accompanied by, by unearthly protection, in accompaniment, accompaniment by the truth such as this, in peace I meet the world. Departing from everything that is leaving all behind, we have gone forward to meet the eye accompanied by what is eternal in it, which cannot be lost. There is no doubt. These are times of initiation. 
I think she would never state this in general from a political social perspective. It was a trial to implement hell on earth. And she wouldn't say, she would say this is true. But as I explained before, from my personal understanding, she tried to, to go into the fight with these evil forces and to say, first of all, it is radical homelessness. And this is a signature of our time and it will get worse in the future. And so what we experience here now as uh, Jewish people um, deported is in a way a model of what is an aspect of the future of mankind. And we have to show, but she never said we, because she only overtook responsibility for herself. I try not just to accept in a perceived way, but I try to, in a way, with a higher support, overcome this kind of misery. Just some words why I'm able at all to talk about her. Maybe you are astonished to now. Letters from a camp, this is not typical for the Nazi camps. In the most camps it was forbidden to write and to document and in so far to create papers of witness. But in this camp of Gurs, which was not um, guarded by the SS, but by the French policemen. And inwardly, in the barracks, it was self-organized by the prisoners. In a way, they couldn't go out, not out of the whole camp, but also the camp was separated in different sections and you couldn't leave the section. The section had 60 barracks and this was your part. And then there was the fence and then there was a French policeman with a gun. But what was inside these, they called them illos, these sections, this was self-organized prisoner's life. And so they could write and there were also no, uh, there was no um, work duty. They just had to be there and to die after a certain time. But so they were, it is not comparable to Buchenwald and Auschwitz-Birkenau and Mauthausen and not comparable to Treblinka and... But it was a horror as well, but they could write. Those who had a sense for it. Uh, so, and I said they were allowed to send a certain amount of letters and most of them by the Red Cross. And the Red Cross was by some sisters also part, some nurses of the camp. There was a certain kind of support and, and therefore these letters uh, went out of the camp. And in the case of Maria Darmstädter, there was a godson of her, um, Walter Schmidthenner, um, and directly after the ending of the war, and when it became clear that she died in Auschwitz, Birkenau, he began to collect all the letters of Maria sent to the relatives and also to the anthroposophical friends by the Swiss Red Cross. I will tell you a little bit later. And he wanted to publish them. It was in 1947 when Schmidthenner more or less had the collected letters, more than 300. But I don't know how, why it was postponed. So the edition came in 97 T to the 30 years memorial of the deportation of the Jews, the Jews from three regions in southern Germany, which we call Baden, Saarland and Pfalz. And she was deported from Mannheim, not so far away from Karlsruhe, maybe you know. And so the book was published in 1970. And I came across the book 40, 14 years ago in 2010. And this is a book uh, with 150 letters of Maria Darmstädter. 
and I realized that she was an anthroposophist and also I realized that Professor Schmidtenner um, did not publish all the letters and also not all the anthroposophical reflections. And I wondered when I came across this book if this literary estate is still existing in the world. Professor Schmidtenner has died, so I asked the archive in Mannheim. And indeed, they had all the 320 letters and postcards from Gurs and also from Drancy, the last place. So I went there and researched further. So I developed it a little bit further. I wanted to find out how she lived with anthroposophy and her Christian esoteric impulses in the camp as far as the letters documented. So in 2010, I published a second book about her, um, 50, 40 years after Professor Schmidt-Henner and by the initiative of Jean Gallag Lee in the United States of America and Christopher Bamford, um, Steiner Books also published um, the biography or let's say the inner path of Mary, Maria Darmstädter um, and when the book was published in the United States of America um, we went all together, a lot of people, to Auschwitz-Birkenau for a kind of um, commemoration. And later on also the leading circle of the Christian community went to Auschwitz-Birkenau and yeah, tried to do something in, in her sense there where she died. And it was surprising and a deep um, gift when some weeks now, just ago, some weeks ago, um, the English painter Craig Trigger uh, surprised me um, by sending a, a picture, um, a photograph of a new painting by him about Maria Darmstädter in the camp. Um, so you see it on the right side. Craig came across the book about uh, this inner journey and Craig Trigger is an expert also for Kaspar Hauser and Anne Frank and many others of these moral leading personalities of the last century and the century before. And I just stayed in Israel when Craig sent me the email and in the appendix I saw Maria Darmstädter in the camp of girls. I think at the moment there is an exhibition of Craig's paintings, newest paintings in the Steiner House London. Um, I don't know if this um, picture is included, this is just a copy out of the email. So I just want to say that her destiny, or let's say her inner path, became a little bit more widespread, at least in the anthroposophical friendship circles um, in the last 14 years. And even if this is a unique path, and I think we all can't copy it, I think it is a deep source of hope for the future, that human beings are able to live under very, very hard conditions and develop this kind of virtues, this kind of capacities. And this is also for me a sign of, of the fact that anthroposophy is belonging to our time, but not as a complementary additional thing on the esoteric spectrum um, of civilization, but as a tool of surviving. Um, that anthroposophy is a path not only to gain insights in the higher world, but to resist. But resisting and going forward with spiritual forces. And this means a relationship to the so-called higher world. So the target of anthroposophy is not to collect additional insights in esoteric matters, but to become a, a true human being. And this kind of becoming a true human being, this is always has to be proved. 
I mean, this is not the sense of concentration camps because there is no sense only in the perspective of evil forces. There is an intention. But that Maria Darmstädter was able, as Edith Stein and others, to go into, she has to go into this zone of misery and to show what are capacities of being true human, truly human, and that in her case it is out of anthroposophy, out of growing weak and faint, as she said, but growing. This was for me courageous or giving help. I mean, the lager of the SS, they won't, hopefully, don't come back in the same style. But we have different situations now worldwide. You never can compare to the guest chambers of the Nazis, but we all know a lot of misery worldwide. And I think it's good to know about those who, even if they died, as Maria who died in Auschwitz, they proved something on the path. So in Steiner's Destiny Lectures, this is one of the main questions. How we de develop virtues, capacities, forces in biographical situation for the future. In so far also reshaping future destiny. Steiner's under understanding of destiny is never that it's an eternal law acting from the past, but it is in facing the reality of human being who is here to shape and reshape situations and make something out of them and creating the future sometimes in the middle of abyss. So shortly I want to maybe five minutes say something about her biography until the deportation, knowing that it's a very short summary. And then I will describe you a little bit in detail how she lived, especially in Gurs, and what happened then. So in an official short biography, she was forced and asked to write down in Gurs in the camp in southern France. She wrote, our childhood home had a sober serious feeling because of my mother's early illness. My father worked hard. I can say that we lived in great prosperity with loving nannies and that an evangelical school laid or formed the foundations for my later life, love of Christ and trust in the workings of destiny. So born in Mannheim in a quite rich Jewish family and as she said, but with an ill mother, chronically ill mother. So there was an atmosphere of seriousness and serious feelings, she said. Um, the parents, even if they were assimilated Jews, they wanted if, that she had Jewish um, religion uh, lessons at school and she had but she discovered in the upper grades of her gymnasium that for herself Christianity belongs to the center of her striving but in a way she always kept the relationship to um, to Judaism and the, this is a wonderful world also of the so-called Old Testament if it's really old, this is one of the main questions. She gave lessons about the so-called Old Testaments in Gurs, when she worked partly also for a Protestant organization in the camp. And some of the inmates, they want to know more about Christianity and Judaism. And they gave lessons and she, in a, in a letter she is describing that she is teaching the Old Testament and what a rich and spiritual important world. So maybe she would never use the terminus of old, but 
for her, I think this was a dialogue in between Judaism and Christianity. So she grew up in Mannheim in this family, two children, uh, two, uh, one brother, one sister. She was the oldest child. And father had a relationship to the United States of America and in a, for a certain time he lived there. And um, a very sensitive child, Maria, there is a self-description of her school time, just two sentences, she said, I had a mess of thick, long hair and sat in the front, um, in the front row of the class because I was extremely short-sighted. Sometimes I would lay my head on the desk and cover myself in the whole forest of hair because too much, too much there in my heart or body, no way through. I was seeking protection from myself, covered over like a natural creature exposed to the gaze hiding itself. There is a similar description of Nelly Sachs about her childhood, describing a little bit hiding herself in the, in the hair and this, this um, impression of it's all too much. We can ask what is too much, but in a way a very sensitive child and um, yeah, I will to make it very short. So after finishing school, she went to the Switzerland to learn the French language, was very interested in literature, languages, went to Lausanne for one year and then to a German university, but soon stopped. This is interesting because she was really a reader, a thinker. Later on, she was befriended with Karl Jaspers and his wife. She was an extremely brilliant thinker and writer, which you can discover if you read the book about her. But she decided not to go on with university studies. She realized this is not her path at university. The brother became a banker and the sister became a painter. But in a way, what was her own profession? She did not know. World War I came. And she suffered a lot um, under the bombing. And um, she said, I withdrew from the reality of the war into literature. She lived again at home. She became engaged to a young man. For her, it was very important to survive inwardly the war by Grunewald by this altar of the spirit, as Martin Buber named in Isenheim, the Isenheimer altar, masterpiece of Grunewald. Martin Buber said it is the altar of spirit of middle Europe, of old Europe, of this Abendland. And she had this painting in her mind during the First World War. Later in a memory she's writing during the last war and nately air rides, the image of this victorious, hoovering, shining, healing, blessing, assured Christ was what I was able to think. For I had such incredible fear, which hurt right into my fingertips. So in a way, she was, I always thought she's a master in being attentive to the misery of the world. Not her own, it was not that only her house is bombed, but maybe the houses of the other ones. How to survive in knowing that others are bombed. So the fear to the fingertips, but also the concentration on, of this resurrected Christ. 10 million of human beings died in the First World War, 10 millions. And at the end of the war, her boyfriend died as well, but not in the war, but in the flu epidemi, epidemics, influenza, who came just directly after the war. 
and her best girlfriend committed suicide. She lived in Lausanne. It was a girlfriend from the Lausanne time. She had two children and a husband and committed suicide. It was a very hard time. Dark night of the soul. There is a painting of Lulu, her sister, of Maria at this time, 20 year, 28 years old, back to the home, homeland of the family, a wonderful old villa in Mannheim. We don't know exactly when the light of Antipasov is shown into her biography. We know that she, she was baptized by her strong wish almost when she was almost 30 years old, so in 1921, in the so-called Christ Church in Mannheim. And this Christ Church was and still is directly opposite more or less of the house the Darmstädters lived at this time. And from an anthroposophical point of view, it is one of the most unique big churches in Germany at this time, because the leading priest, the leading Protestant priest was an anthroposophist, Paul Klein. He was also leader of one of the two branches of the society, the anthroposophical society in Mannheim. And so the branch met in the, in the priest's house in the church. And it's a huge church and there is a sign of Michael is on the top of the dome. And by Paul Klein, there was an initiation, a path to anthroposophy. We know that latest in 23, she joined the Christian community, which was founded in 22. And this wonderful Rudolf Frieling came to Mannheim, this brilliant priest and thinker of early Christianity and future Christianity. So this was very important for her. She discovered anthroposophy and the Christian community and I always had a feeling for her it belonged together. It's not the same. Religion is not spiritual science, but spiritual science enabled a new epoch of Christian religion in her understanding. In a way, her destiny, I don't know if she really came across the mystery dramas at this time, but her biography has a certain nearness to the so-called other Maria in the, um, in the portal of initiation. Um, probably you know that this other Maria in the drama, after very strong biographical experiences, um, death of the husband, total collapse, decided uh, to go found anthroposophy and welfare, welfare work. So maybe you, you hear her talking to, to dedicate a life that still remains to me to those whose destiny is full of affliction and adversity. And more or less Maria, probably without knowing the mystery drama at this stage, chose the same. And she made a kind of a training of, as a nurse or an assistant nurse in the diaconie nearby Düsseldorf. But she had to stop it because the mother was so ill again that she went home to serve the mother. At this time, there was a young man who fell in love to Maria, was eight years younger than she, and discovered anthroposophy by her. His name is Emil Krebil, and asked for marriage. And so they decided to marry in 1928. Um, and their, um, their wedding holidays went to the opening of the Goethe Anum. So what I, I said in my introduction that she took part in the opening of the second Goethe Anum and saw the statue uh, of the representative of mankind. And Kribil became a strong co-worker of the leadership of the the priest of the Christian community in the so-called Urach House in Stuttgart. He became the main and only secretary at this time. So he typed 
with the typing machine, the priests um, little journal, they had a kind of internal journal, but also he typed the courses Dr. Steiner gave to them. He was in the center of the Urach house and so she joined his life and um, unfortunately Emil Krebel wanted to found a family but she could not get children anymore and he fell into love into a younger woman and asked for divorce and separation. She let him go even if she always till her de till she died had the feeling that they belong together and you can't separate what is grounded for the whole biography but she accepted of course and let him go. One of the main problems is that he was not a Jew a Jew, so now she again was completely Jewish. And this was in 1933 when he left her. She went again back home to Mannheim. And now the very hard time began over seven years till the deportation, the restriction year by year get worse. I don't want to repeat the story of what happened in 33, 34, 35, 30, and so on, year by year, it became more difficult to live. So also the, both um, the brother and, 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 and the sister, they left Germany, but she stayed with the parents until they died and until they were very poor at the end and the house was by a compulsory action auction, it was um, sold and they had to leave the house. And so at the end there was poverty. Um, and, but she was in so far glad that the parents could die in, in freedom and peace. Um, 1936, both together, only some weeks in between, and Rudolf Darmstadt, the father, was a famous person in Mannheim, but less than 10 people came to the funeral. So she lost almost everything. Um, and Franz Darmstadt, who emigrated to Switzerland, and Lulu, who emigrated to Prague and then to the United States, always asked her to come. But she said, I will stay here in Mannheim as long as the services in the Christian community are still held. And this was for the family now a sufficient explanation. But she had obviously the impression that now in this time of evil and destruction, this power emanating from the act of Golgotha is so needed for the future. So she took it for very serious. I don't think that she for her own sake only went to the services, but that they were really performed and also accompanied by consciousness and getting effective as a contribution to the world's resurrection from its destruction. And she knew that this kind of effective ritual depends upon conscious participation. So the family did not understand. She was always different from the other ones. And then came the 22nd of October 1940, when the SS and Gestapo and the policemen came and all the Jews from Mannheim were deported. So she had one or two hours time to collect her things, small things, and then to go to the deportation place. So all the Jews of uh, Mannheim had to go. The, older, the oldest was 98 year man, years old, the youngest was three and a half months. Also all psychiatric patients who were Jewish, all those who lived in 
the home for the retired. And that's what, by the way, what she did since the parents died. The last four years she took care for old Jewish people. She went to the to the to these old people's home places and tried to assist them physically by soul forces spiritually. She had a feeling that this is um, what she what she had to do. Um, and then the deportation. And they were brought to this camp near the Pyrenees in southern France. Altogether more than 6,000 Jews, 6,500 Jews from Baden, Pfalz and Saarland. And they came there in an atmosphere of total, um, total desolation. This camp was extremely primitive, these wooden barracks without any beds for this 98-year-old man and for the other elderly. They had to lie on the floor. It was, it was end of October, it was still warm, but then November came and heavy rains and Gurs was on a very deep level and if the rain was coming it was all mud. In between the barracks you'd sink in to the mud and there were a lot of hungry rats in the barracks. There was no window to open. Um, it was the coming winter and they were just there. Imagine 6,500 and 10,000 were already there. So 16,000 people living there under the sky. It was raining and almost nothing anymore. So they, they got something, a soup to eat in the morning and in the evening um, and a little amount of bread. But we can easily understand that more than 30 of them died a day, more than 1,000 in the first winter. Um, she survived 14 months in Gurs, and she survived in doing what I sketched from the beginning of this lecture in serving the other ones. And Jean directly in the first letters she was able to send home or to Franz Darmstadt who lived here in Basel, Binningen. She's saying that uh, she's okay. Um, she's living in peace with everything and she accepts and and she is fully engaged and fully active for her neighbors. And saying in the letter to the brother, you can say that my house was in good order when I left. For a long time I had only the absolute essentials, which then one thought of as the absolute essentials. But it was of course luxury compared to here. But I was always ready for this kind of upheaval. In a way she was ready to go all the time. And she only had, so the last thing she had in Mannheim and went to France where the uh, Vincenzo Foppa copy of the resurrected shah. So the, um, the famous painting of Christ. And so little things she had in her little apartment near the train station when the deportation order came. But she means also by her inner moral situation, she was not surprised, even it was a shock in the morning when the police came. But my house was in good order when I left. You know that I'm fortunate to be alone in all this, my neighbor for my relative. And one has an opportunity to help in so many circumstances. The poor people, the poor old people. One has to keep one's courage up and stay healthy. Having learned humility previously means drawing now on a wonderful sources of strength. So in a way she felt trained by the last years when she was serving the old Jewish people in Mannheim. And now it went on. 
Yes, I stand in peace with the world. So this sentence of the act of consecration of men was always in her mind. This peace with the world can also be with you. And she sent the verse of the so-called Samaritan course of Dr. Steiner given at the Goetheanum at the beginning of the First World War. She sent this verse to another inmate who was also an anthroposophist. As long as you feel the pain that I am spared, Christ working in the human being is unperceived. And weak remains the spirit that always only in its own body is capable of suffering. So this kind of attentiveness for the suffering of the other one, this practice of overcoming personal needs and to live out of the essential power of the spirit, this was her spiritual resistance in Gurus. <laughs> once once, once she, she wrote in a letter that she has the feeling now in girls in this camp that the whole life is meant as rite, as ritual. The so-called everyday life, she had the feeling under such conditions has to be worship or in a way a religious act. And we can ask where she had the power from because in a way she was not healthy at all when she came to Gurs. She had a very difficult um, disease um, of the spleen of now of the kidney and extremely high blood pressure by the kidney disease and irregularity of the heart rhythm. She was somatically ill and um, 48 years old and I think from a medical point of view she was not one of those you would have expected she will overcome the first winter. But she not only overcame it but she served the other ones all the time and when she got parcels from her brother from Basel Binningen with extra food, with extra um, shirts and warm winter clothes she shared it to the other one. So it was for her a kind of clear that she won't keep these things for herself. And the other ones tried that at least she's eating something out of the content of the parcel. Because they realized Maria is giving everything away and losing more or less. But where, is, where this also healthy forces were from I mean, I would say the Christ relationship was one of the main sources for her. And the inmost daily prayer was the Psalm 23 for her. Um, I will end maybe the lecture then um, with this Psalm later. Um, a second source is the cycle of the year, which in a way sounds a little bit crazy because I talked about November and rain and storms and but of course suddenly the sun was coming again and she said this, the cycle of the year, I will totally have it in mind here in this exposed situation. She's, they saw the Pyrenees, the Pyrenean mountains at the end of the horizon and in the morning she tried to go directly to the fence to see the colors every day which took a lot of energy to go especially if it was so dirty and full of mud with two stocks and but she went there the cycle of the year the landscape the seasons of the year this was very important for her Accompanied by meditations, the calendar of the soul, she said it's the best place girls, to practice it because you are fully exposed to this. But also the epistles of the Christian community, 
She had the most parts by heart. And to the other anthroposophist, Tony Schwarz, she was sometimes writing parts of the epistolas to another barrack. It was not the same ELO, the same section, but she could send posts. They could they were allowed to send posts to the other barracks. And these letters to the other barrack, they are also now in the archive of Mannheim. So I discovered that she was quoting long passages of the epistolas of the Christian community and sending them so the word about Michael at, in this time and others. Another source is, was the connection to the, the relatives and especially also to the spiritual relatives or to the spiritual friends. In her case, this was most was the Christian community in Mannheim and they got the letters from Switzerland and then they read it together. So if the letter of Maria were coming to Mannheim, this was an event. And I know it personally because when I started my research, there were still some of them alive, especially Gertrud Hermann, who was a girl when Maria was deported. And she brought her to the last point where they had, the non-Jews had to go back. And when I started to research, she was still there, Gertrud Hermann and also her sister. And they told me, Gertrud told me how when the letters from Gürs were coming by Switzerland, how they, yeah, they came together, circle of friends, and heard these reports. And of course, if there was an act of consecration of men, they had her in mind. And she felt that, that she is still part, she's still there in, in the circle of friends. And there are many letters where she's saying, I'm living out of your, or I'm living also because of your forces. And then the community of the inmates, she had the feeling this is a new community out of need, out of misery. But in a way, she was working for a community of the inmates, not with everybody because, yeah, but there were a lot who, of those who need her support and they became friends. And for her, it was also a social situation. We have to share this. The dimension of art I want to mention because her brother Franz was able to send her postcards from Grünewald and others, and they were part of the barrack. She was allowed to have the postcards near the bed, and colors and art, this was extremely important. Once she called Gürs le prison de Dieu. It was a kind of a prison. Um, but she tried to bring in the religious aspect, prison de Dieu. I will make the end quite short. What happened then? Everybody was almost sure that she won't survive the second winter. So she survived from 1940 to 41, and then spring came and summer came, and she had birthday. It was a big, not a party, but they collected, and she got many gifts there very moving and then but autumn came and winter and it was clear that she won't survive the second winter she was too weak quite often she was in the little hospital of this a barrack a hospital barrack and there was also the swiss red cross elspeth kasser a very wonderful young nurse taking care for girls and they all said we have we tried to bring her out of the camp and there was a chance if there was enough money from the family and if the family found a private apartment not too far from the prison, from the camp, they were allowed to go for three months for recovery if they go to the police station every third day. So a kind of controlled, out of a controlled situation out of the camp if you have the money 
for the apartment if you have relatives and if the doctor was saying it is needed. It was no extermination camp. It was just a camp for prisoners. And the family was working hard, not, not so much for the money, which was not the main problem, if, even if they were not rich anymore, but how to say, to, to convince Maria to accept it. To convince her that she has to go, because she said, no, I won't go. I'm part of the community of the inmates, of the prisoners. But because the prisoners also said, you have to go to come back because you can't help us anymore if you are dying. So please accept the three months if it's possible. And so it became possible. So at the end of the year 41, she could leave for three months to a little apartment in a little village called Limonest and a little room in a little hotel or auberge and suddenly she was out. And these are incredible letters being out, having a room for your own, having a bed, having a desk, having a chair, having real paper, being alone, not with 60 other people in a small barrack, being your own. But how to accept it and how to live knowing that the other ones are still there. So what started was a correspondence when Maria was sending four or five letters a day to several inmates and they sent letters to her. This correspondence is lost because there were no survivors of Gürs. Apart from those who had the same chance as Maria to leave it for a certain time, Toni Schwartz survived, her friend. But this correspondence with the inmates is lost. And, but I only name it because she kept the relation. I said attentiveness of the suffering of the other. She tried to regain her forces to go back. But on the same time lived in this little room and got the Goethe Anum journal weekly from the brother Franz Darmstädter. She was reading Das Goethe Anum and courses of Dr. Steiner in freedom. In a way, she was deeply touched by this gratitude. And on the other side, she knew that she has to go back. And in a way, but she was so ill that it was then they got a second three months period and even a third three months period of being for recovery. And to make it now very short, what happened is the decision of what we call the Wannsee decision in January 1942 that the Nazis under Heydrich and Himmler decided that all Jews had to be brought out of Europe, brought to Poland and to the um, concentration camps which were extermination camps. And the decision all Jews registered German Jews and other Jews from France, 800,000 had to be brought by transport. And Maria, you can see it in the letters, she had a feeling in the course of 1942, it's getting darker and darker. And then in August, in August, suddenly, Gürs was was really the SS. No, it was not the SS. Other other policemen, French policemen, who had the order to bring the inmates to the um, to lorries, and they all had to go. So they were encircled. Some of them committed suicide. Other ones tried to escape in the camp, in the barrack, to hide themselves. But they all had to go. And for Maria, there was no more answer. She was. She sent her letters to Gurs, but no response anymore. She realized in August that it happened. And she realized also that suddenly there will be knocking on her door because she was also a registered Jew in Limonest. So, and they want to have all of them. So, this was the most difficult month, August, September, October, November 
waiting for the deportation. And of course we can ask, why didn't she try to escape? Because every third day she has to go to the to police, but there are two days in between, but where to go? And out of which forces? And so the relatives, especially Franz Darmstädter, tried to bring her to Switzerland. And he organized, there were people who tried to bring uh, people over the Swiss border, which was closed, in fact. But there are hidden ways. She didn't want to, to accept these hidden ways, but at the end she resigned a second time. She said yes. As she said yes in leaving Gurs, now she said yes in, okay, I will go to the point where I will meet this man and so on. To the second time she had a feeling it was not her own decision. And in fact, she, when she realized that all the Jews had, were deported to, the, to Poland, then she said, I would have been in their company and this was maybe my past with them and now I'm alone beyond the street beyond and now but she said yes to this trial and in fact they succeeded and they came to Switzerland but then on the Swiss ground they knocked on a house and this house there were no Swiss people in but German soldiers so in fact she directly said she is a Jew and she is, um, and they brought her to Trancy and um, she, yeah, she said, yeah, this is now where I have to go. In Trancy, just to mention this, there was a very special encounter with this man who later on published her letters, Walter Schmidthenner, because the godson at this time was a student but also a German officer of the German army and he got the allowance to see her because the father was a minister in Baden and they had good relations. He, was, he got the allowance to see Maria Darmstädter in Trancy and he organized that she was not directly deported to Auschwitz but brought to the Rothschild hospital and they had a wonderful conversation or a deep conversation, and I just want to quote one very strange sentence. She said to Walter Schmidthenner, please say to all friends, I'm a good representative of Germany. This is a very strange sentence. On the way to Auschwitz-Birkenau saying, say to our friends, I'm a good representative of Germany. I don't know what is the meaning in behind, but I still think she had another image of, of another Germany. And to represent something which is now destroyed and lost. And part of this Germany was also this Jewish, uh, Jewish and Christian dialogue and this culture, this real deep culture Germany was also one at this time still keeping. In a way she, she said yes to Germany and go, went to the extermination. I don't know, maybe it's also a sentence of resistance, spiritual resistance. Of course, the Nazi said she's absolutely no representative of Germany because she's Jewish. But she said, I am, I am a good one. And in so far I, I go this path. And the last astonishing element that she was in the same transport um, as we know today by the Yad Vashem archive and by um, the researchers having done um, in the same transport that as um, Henrietta Ginder Fritkin, who was the Jewish anthroposophical doctor from Ukraine, which was here with Dr. Steiner taking care for the co-workers, the ill co-workers in building the first Goethe Anum during the First World War. And when Steiner gave this course with this verse I quoted before about the pain of the other one, 
the so-called Samaritan course, she was the doctor on his side. So Henrietta Ginder Friedkin and Dr. Steiner gave this course in September 1914. And later on she went to Paris when Steiner died. And she ended in the same transport than Maria Darmstädter to this place. And also astonishing that the train passed Mannheim. So today I've been to Mannheim on her birthday and stay standing there in the train station. So this was the place where she was deported and coming back, but then passing by Dresden and Leipzig um, to Auschwitz. Yeah, it's very difficult to end and to find the right words to end it. Um, maybe one passage of a letter and then this psalm 23, her innermost praying uh, in the camp of Gurs. How she ended in Auschwitz, just to say she was on the list on that same day and then Henrietta Gitta Fritkin. So we know the name on the list of this 11th of February 1943. And we know that from this transport, um, almost all prisoners were directly killed in Birkenau in the guest chamber. And although a small number was not directly killed, but brought into the camp, and they were all registered. But neither Henrietta Kinder Friedkin nor Maria Darmstädter are registered in the Auschwitz camp. That means they belong by age and physical situation to those who couldn't work in an extent the Nazi wanted. So they were all designed to go directly to the gas chamber. Um, so I want to end with one of the last letters she, she sent um, from Drancy. Um, no, it was a little bit before from Limonest. And then I will uh, read this, this um, psalm, which was so important for her. So in this letter she's sending, she's saying, Il ne faut pas savoir le matin où l'on couchera le soir. So in English, you should not know in the morning where you will lie your head at night. And then she's saying, this is nothing other than the path to truth and life, the intrinsic nature of initiation, to possess as if one possesses nothing. To regard everything one has and it is only being lent. And what this, this requires other than to take wing, to lift the soul of the food from the ground, shake off the dust when the spiritual journey begins. You may think my words are riddle and there is no more I can say to you. We will be transformed from one clarity to another and wandering from one pain into the next. We are the people of God whose path is as ever the path to God. Cast out and willing to suffer, we are victorious in pursuing a devotional obedience. The lamp is the symbol of a willingness to follow a path that is essential if we are to prevail without violence, speechless, pervaded only by the strength of gentleness, the strength of the path to be followed. The love of God passes all understanding. Is this true? It is true. It equips us to be children and to fulfill our sacrifice in the Father. And then the Psalm 23 in the translation of um, 
of one of the priests of the Christian community, Professor Beck, but now here um, into English by Matthew Barton, with gratitude. Who speaks the eye within me is my shepherd. I shall not want. He gives me repose on green pastures. pastures. He guides me to the waters of life. He restores my soul. He leads me upon the path of truthfulness within his eye-being's prevailing power. Though I pass through the abyss of the dark shadows of death, I shall fear no danger of evil, for you are with me. You rod and your staff I must support and comfort. You lay for me a table in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. You fill my cup to overflowing. Yes, good and mercy shall bear my, me through all the days of my life. And in the house of the Lord, who speaks the eye in me, I will repose forever. Yes, I hope we got a little bit insight in this hidden biography of Maria Darmstädter on her birthday many, many years later. But it is her day, two days before St. John's Day, historical conscience. Many questions remain about human dignity and what do we call destiny and what about the genocidal 20th century but also what about the forces of resistance and the forces of overcoming so in the name of the general anthroposophical section of Klaus Peter Rö and Constanza Kalix and Nicolas Kribles and Andrea de la Cruz, I thank you all for being with us tonight in Edith Marion's house, who was also a servant for the so-called Christ impulse. The artist who performed together with Dr. Steiner this statue, which was so important for Maria Thamstedter. So tonight we came back into Edith Marion's house, also a very earnest servant, serving, selflessness, co-worker. Co-worker on the building of anthroposophy, that means building of spiritual humanity, restoring the image of man in a century or more than one century, who is closer than the, to the abyss than ever before. So we thought it is a good idea to bring Maria Darmstädter's story in the house of Edith Marion on this hill of destiny, even if we don't know exactly what is destiny. But we approach to it and we hope that the leading stars of those who went these paths in such a glorious way, I would say, in the midst of the night, that they will shine our light to the future. So I hope that for you also, it is not only a set and evening, but also a kind of a, yeah, a kind of a nutrition or a spiritual substance in gaining hope and courage for the challenges of the future. So hopefully Maria Darmstädter or Krebel Darmstädter, how she wanted to be named, will also play a role in our consideration, reflections, meditations and prayers in the future. Thank you all for being with us tonight and for your attentiveness. And maybe until the next time in this serial of English lectures and especially also the serial of lectures about Hebrew humanism in the 20th century, the next person in our focus will be Emmanuel Levinas in autumn 
and then on his birth date, Paul Celan, in November. But thank you for tonight.